OK, buenos dias. Oh, no, that has very low energy. We need high energy. I'm in Miami. I'm off a of red eye. Buenos dias. OK, animo. Animo, mi gente. Uh, thank you, Manny, for having me. Very excited to be here. And uh, let's talk. we get some slides up here. Let's talk about what is going on in the world today. We know the world is radically changing politically, economically, technologically. And my observation is that Latinos are not in the game, in the game of business, in the game of technology. So I want to give a little bit of a reality check, one person's perspective. I've spent a long time working in finance, working in technology, in media, advertising, and for the past decade in things related to data and artificial intelligence. So 23 plus years in business and technology. Starting to get some of the grays to show the years. But I've always asked, where are the Latinos? I'm usually in a room if I'm in Silicon Valley and I'm the only Latino. When I started in investment banking many moons ago in the early 90s, I was the only Latino. When I was in advertising, working at the largest media agency, I was the only Latino on the exec team. And so I have to ask the question, are Latinos invisible? Now more than ever, we have to ask ourselves this question. And as a data guy, we have to look at the data. So you'll see at this amazing experience called Hispanicize, I'm sure many people would talk about the size of the Latino market. 58 million Latinos in this country. That's awesome. That's great. And we know it's going to grow from 18% of the population to almost 30% in the next couple of decades. That's great. And over half of our millennials are multicultural, dominated by Latinos. That's great. But what if those aren't the only numbers that matter? Remember apartheid in South Africa? Large numbers, not as large of an impact or influence. So we need to look at some other numbers. And I invite everyone here to have this sobering look at the data. Are we invisible politically? We know it's a very traumatic time going on in this country right now, very divisive. And the good news is we now have over 27 million Latino voters. And we know how many of our population are actually turning 18 and voting or voting eligible every single month. But the reality is we under-index. If we're 18% of the US population, only 12% of Latinos are eligible voters. So we are under-indexing in how we can actually impact the vote. This is 2016 data. We have a record number of Hispanic elected officials. That is wonderful. We need to run for office. We need your voice. But we are only 1% of elected officials in this country. That is an embarrassment. We are 18% of the population. We have 1% representing us. That's a problem. How about economically? Well, in corporate America, we now have a record 142 Latinos on corporate boards where the power and the influence and the money is. But that's only 2.6% of the Fortune 500. And when you think about all the senior executives across the Fortune 500, it's only about 3%. So we're not even showing up in corporate America. That's great that you saw all these executives up here talking, but are they in the right seats? Are they a CEO? Are they a CMO? Are they a CTO? Are they a CFO? Are they in the positions of power and influence? That's great that we could talk about diversity and multicultural, but if you're not talking about the language of business, you're not in the game. You don't have a seat at the table. One of the bright spots is seeing the growth in Hispanic-owned businesses, 15 times that of what's been started by anyone else over the past decade. And there are lots of bright spots. Over 4.4 million Hispanic-owned businesses contributing over $700 billion to the US economy and a great, great stat of over 1.5 million Latino businesses being started by Latinas, women-owned businesses. And I'm proud to say that my wife is one of them. So shout out to my wife. Um, she started her own multicultural kids media company with a partner, another Latina, and they just did a partnership with Nickelodeon that goes live next month. So we're super excited and I'm very proud of her. But we don't have enough Latinos starting the right types of jobs. Over 15% of jobs that are started by Hispanic-owned businesses are retail 
or food services or construction. And I'll come back to this, but those are not the right types of jobs for the future. And then we always hear about the Latino buying power, $1.5 trillion. I can never really wrap my head around that. Like, what does that mean? Does someone walk around with $1.5 trillion in their pocket? No. But that's a very impressive stat that comes from Nielsen. But the reality tells a little bit of a different picture. This is an article that came out in December. Blacks and Latinos will be broke in a few decades. Broke. When you think about median household wealth, there's durable goods and non-durable goods. When you take out the durable goods, like a car, you know, big items, we are at $2,000 of median household wealth. And this is something that has been trending down over time. And by the way, we're not unique. It's not just us. It's the black and brown community, right? African Americans are right there along with us. And the white population continues to steadily recover from the Great Recession, but where we are going, that's a very bad trajectory. Because if you plot this out, and the economists have forecasted over the next 30, 40, 50 years, we're going down to zero wealth. On average, by 2073, and a lot of people say the tipping point when this becomes a multicultural majority country in 2040, around that time, 30 years after that, we will be at zero median household wealth. There's a reality check for you. And the most important force reshaping our economy today is technology. Are we invisible technologically? Well, we all know the importance of STEM. And the reality is, I now live in Silicon Valley. It is atrocious. I'm a New Yorker, born and raised, proud Dominicano. But being out in the valley, it is unbelievable the lack of diversity, the lack of Latinos. We're just not in the game. And so if you look across the board at all the big tech companies, maybe 3 or 4%, you see some of the higher percentages. Amazon at 13%, Apple at 12%. Uh, but that's retail. That's not engineering. That's not in the core technology skills. And it's also not in the business leadership positions either. But there's something much more concerning that we all need to wake up to. And so who here, raise your hand, knows who Mark Andreessen is? Raise your hand. OK, I see a handful of folks. Mark Andreessen was the co-founder of Netscape. Remember Netscape? Maybe I'm dating myself again, the gray hair. Uh, started the first internet browser. He is now a very prominent venture capitalist, and he's probably one of the most savvy folks about technology. And he came out with a prediction back in August of 2011 that software is eating the world. And what does that mean? That means everything will be digitized, and that technology will permeate every aspect of our lives. And in 2018, it kind of feels that way. But the reality is we're just at the beginning. We are at the dawn of what is going to be known as the AI era, artificial intelligence. What is artificial intelligence? Fancy word. It just means that machines can mimic what humans do, the cognitive functions to learn, to problem solve. And guess what? Machines don't get tired. Machines don't need a coffee break, un cafecito. Machines don't need to go out and listen to some salsa. They could just work and work and work and work. And so there is a fundamental competitive advantage that machine learning has over human learning. And certainly there's lots of buzz, got lots of hype. It could just be noise, right? But the reality is we tend to overestimate technologies in the short term, but we dramatically underestimate technology in the long term. Just to give you a little bit of a sense and perspective, AI plus cloud technology is truly creating the fourth industrial revolution. And you could go back to how economies have been completely transformed by the introduction of a new technology. AI will be bigger than the internet. Let that sink in. Everyone remember your dial-up, your AOL, or CompuServe, or Prodigy back in the day, and how bad the experience was? Now, that wasn't that long ago. That was like 19, mid-90s, right? 98. 30 years later, we're just now hitting our stride. But when you think about how AI is going to permeate every aspect of our economy, and that we are now fundamentally at a tipping point, and the difference is this is like compound interest for you finance folks out there. It grows exponentially. And so you are going to see how machines can learn 
and the opportunities and the experiences that we will have are going to be unbelievable. And there is only a handful of companies that are going to be able to do this because this is a winner-take-all market. This is about understanding how do you leverage the cloud, how do you build the software, you need to have the data for the machine to learn, and then you need to have the talent. And there is a war for AI talent going on right now. And China is actually winning this war between China and the US. And so I'm proud to be working for one of these companies, Quantcast, which was founded by a Brit who's been doing AI for 25 years, got his PhD in that. But the reality is AI will radically impact every customer experience, every company, and every industry. And so there's a very famous computer scientist, Andrew Eng, who used to lead Google Brain, their AI efforts, went to Baidu, the Chinese search company, and was leading their AI efforts. And now he has his own VC, his own venture fund focused on AI. And he calls AI the new electricity. So if you think about electricity, how it came to be, you know, maybe there was a VP of electricity back in the day, I don't know. But it permeated every industry. It transformed every customer experience. That is what's going to happen with AI. Every industry, whether it's automotive or retail, financial services, marketing, whatever it is, it will be transformed by AI. And so maybe some of you are asking, well, what does this have to do with Latinos? Well, it actually has everything to do with Latinos. Because an emerging concern is who is writing the AI? Who is writing the code? We know about unconscious bias. We talk about it all the time in the Valley. But we know there's a limited pool of people that are either controlling platforms, controlling software development, actually writing the code that will impact all of our lives. And guess what? The folks that are writing that code aren't Latino. But more importantly, the biggest concern is the AI mantra. Anything that can be automated will be. Anything that can be automated will be. A recent report by the World Bank talked about the risks of jobs being replaced by automation. In the US, they said 47% of jobs are at risk. Think about that. That's almost half of the, of, of the jobs in this economy. And then in countries that are, even though they're large, like China and India population-wise, what is the type of work that is done? Focus on the work. It's menial work. It's, uh, it's redundant work. It's physical work. All those jobs will be replaced by AI. And the reality is, no matter where you are in the country, maybe there's some pockets that will be less impacted than others, but it's all on the margin. AI will permeate every aspect of our economy. And so the question that I ask for all of you is, can a machine do your job? Think about it. Can a machine do your job better than you? Because again, you get tired, you need to eat, you need to go to the bathroom, whatever it is. And when people are asked this question, most people say, oh, well, 10% of workers probably think, nah, I guess machines can probably do my job. But not me. It's not going to happen to me. But the reality is most people think that a machine can do other people's jobs. So it's not going to happen to me. It'll happen to other people. Love that. But the reality is it's going to impact all of us, specifically Latinos. A new article that came out in The Atlantic in December talked about how Latinos are the most susceptible, and they will actually suffer the most amount of casualties. And think about the industries where we work, where our community, where our families work, in retail, in automotive, in service industries, in hospitality industries. When you see the wave of automation that's going to happen, how is that going to impact our community? They say the top 20 most popular job occupations by Latinos are all going to be impacted by AI. And we overrepresent in jobs where we're not digitally savvy, where we actually don't have a lot to you know, kind of impact or you know, there's not a lot of value add. Those are things that a machine could probably do better than us. And so all these types of jobs that are highly susceptible to automation, to AI, Think about where are you in the spectrum? Where are your friends? Where is your family? This is real people. This is going to happen. So are we invisible to all these forces? Maybe some people think we are, because we haven't raised our voice, because we're not in the positions of power and influence. But I'm here 
to really have this conversation be a wake-up call? How do we have this reality check? No one is going to solve this for us. There are too many haters out there, including our president. Only we can solve this, and the emphasis is on the we, as Latinos, as united Latinos. I want to be very clear. Nobody cares about our problems. Everyone's got their own problems. It is up to us to figure out how do we come together as a community. We need to change our mindset. Some people could see the glass is half full or half empty. How are you going to look at it as half full and then leverage that? Now is the time to truly change our mindset as a community. And instead of being invisible, I like to talk about invisible superpowers that we have as a community, things that only Latinos can do. When you think about creativity, well, that's kind of an invisible superpower. We've got incredible talent. Think about our ability to create, whether it's music and art and culture. Think about the world's most streamed song of all time to this conference. Thank you, Manny. That is a creative community. And the World Economic Forum think that that's going to be a really important skill going forward. Because the reality is, there are so many things that can be automated. Creativity is not one of them. So how are each and every one of you being creative? How are you going to leverage creativity in this AI era? The second invisible superpower, I believe, is our work ethic. And it's a proud immigrant work ethic. I am the son of immigrants. My mother, who passed away two years ago, she came to this country from the Dominican Republic. That's her in DC in the 60s, wearing some kind of dress. I don't know what she was doing there. But the point is, you know, this work ethic is in all of us. Whether we're first or second or third or fourth, doesn't matter what generation. It is a common bond that we all share. If we can cross borders, if we can cross bridges, if we can put our whole lives in a suitcase, that is an incredible work ethic to get things done. Some people call that hustle, right? That's a common word here in the States. But where I am now living in California, in Silicon Valley, that's called entrepreneurship, right? That's what you need, that work ethic, to get shit done. So how are we going to use that work ethic in the AI era? How are we going to create our own businesses? How are we going to create our own media? Think about it, we don't own our own media. Everyone talks about Univision and Telemundo. Those are owned by big multi-national you know, national conglomerates. We don't own our own media. In this day and age, why don't we? Why don't we build our own startups? There's tons of capital out there. You have incredible groups like the Caper Capital, Caper Center, that are investing in black and brown entrepreneurs. There are resources out there. How do we take back control? How do we, we use our work ethic to build those businesses? We need to focus on the work. As much as we like to talk about all these things that are kind of on the periphery, when you focus on the business, when you focus on the technology, that's what matters. That's how you get the power and influence. And we get the job done. So how are you going to prepare for the AI era? And then a final superpower to think about is really our culture. We need to move this thinking, as beautiful as our culture is, from me to we. What is the most important thing in our lives? It's familia. This is my family. I have a two and a half year old son, Celestian, and I now have a three month old daughter named Sienna. I want them to come into a world where Latinos are united. This is about our Latino family. I am sick and tired of hearing about all the differences that we have. That tears us apart. That does not help us move forward in an AI era. We need to have strength in numbers, now more than ever. No one is going to help us. No one is going to come save us. Nobody cares about us. If that was not evident over the past two years with everything that's happened in business, in politics, it is on us. So we have to stop focusing on our differences. As much as I love the different types of Spanish from Colombia and Mexico and Puerto Rico and La República, I don't care about that. 
We have to stop focusing on the differences. It is time for us to focus on what we have in common, our shared values, our familia. If we do not rally, if we don't figure out how to come together, unidos, we're not going to make it, people. We have to get each other's back. There are so few of us that are out there. I'm one of a handful of CMOs in corporate America. When you see another executive, another professional, another artist, I don't care who it is, we need to support them. We need to celebrate them. This is one of my mentors, Antonio Lucio. He's Puerto Rican, and he is the CMO of HP, Fortune 20 company. This man is doing more to impact change in our industry of media, marketing, advertising, because he is mandating that all of his agencies look like his consumers. He's talking about business. He has a seat at the table. He is talking to the CEO. He is making ads that reflect this room. But you only earn that seat at the table when you're talking about business, when you're talking about shared values, when you understand the technology. We need to celebrate our own. If you see a Latino business, buy from that Latino business. I don't care what they produce. It could be high heels. Buy the high heels for your wife, for your girlfriend, for your sister. I don't care. Support Latino businesses. Find a way to celebrate. There's so many haters out there. There's so many haters against us. So what are we doing together to figure out how do we have that bond to support each other? You know, I was absolutely just dumbfounded when Jorge Ramos was thrown out of that press conference. And I am ashamed that I did not speak out more using my platform. All of us should have rallied. It doesn't matter if he's of Mexican descent. He's Latino. That is what I'm talking about. And all the things that are happening in DACA, guess what? That happens to them, it'll happen to you. So we need to be united, strength in numbers. And take a page out of the playbook. The black community is amazing. They look out for their own. They rally. Do you think if something happens in a black community and the Reverend Al Sharpton is not going to show up? <laughs> but who's our Reverend Al? We laugh, but we don't have one. Who's going to look out for us? The Jewish community. It is unbelievable the network that they have. They pay it forward. If there is a Jewish business executive person, entrepreneur, whatever it is, they will support you. They help each other out. That's what I'm talking about. We need to take pages out of these playbooks because the time is now. This is not a joke. So how are you leveraging our culture, our values, shared values, common values to make an impact? There's so many opportunities. The reality is AI is going to open up a brand new world. You could look at that glass as half empty. I choose to see the world as half full. And the reality is you're going to see whole industries wiped out. You're going to see all these jobs disappear, but new jobs will be created in its stead. There will be new opportunities, entrepreneurs that will step in to fill the vacuum. And you now have more tools. It's cheaper. You have more data. You have more access to capital. So how are you leveraging this opportunity? How are you getting each other's back? These numbers are horrible. But as an old boss used to tell me, you can't fall off the floor. So guess what? Let's raise these numbers. Let's figure out how to get more elected officials. Let's figure out how to get more executives in the C-suite. Let's figure out how to get more money in our pockets. Because with power and influence, that's how we're going to make a change. And I know that we could do it. That is our work ethic. That's our DNA. And if we're going to be a multicultural majority, we have to rise up and take our place. Our creativity will do it, our work ethic, our culture, our opportunities. Let's be visible. Thank you.